Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Lisa Oswald. Uh, Lisa is a PhD student at the Hedda School in Berlin. Her research is embedded in computational social science and focuses on public deliberation in online environments <clears throat> and uh, the role of digital media for democratic politics. Lisa integrates psychological and political science perspectives with the aim to use digital trace data and online experiments to better understand social phenomena like climate change skepticism, online hate speech, uh, and political polarization. So um, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much for the kind introduction and thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, I think I, I never summarized my work better than you just did, so that's super nice. Uh, and yeah, I think uh, I would just say, share my screen and then uh, start, right? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Let's go. I hope you can all see my screen. I might just have to minimize you a little bit. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions down the road, also just feel free to interrupt me or raise your hand. I'm pretty sure I can see it. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer yeah, any questions along the way or otherwise, um, yeah, later on in the Q&A. And uh, yeah, again, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm really excited that I have a bit more time to actually talk about my project today, because uh, you all know in those conference settings, you're always very like limited in time and have to squeeze in everything into 10 minutes or so. And um, yeah, so now we can take it a bit more easy, but of course I will not <laughs> like, go overboard with anything. Um, yeah, and as I already said, I'm doing my PhD at the Hertie School and um, now I'm basically under the wing of a political scientist. So I have a bit more of that perspective in my PhD, but originally or, or by training, I'm a psychologist, um, just to give a bit more context. And today I would like to present some work about um, or using digital trace data and um, yeah, I, I gave the presentation to a sort of more or less catchy title, who engages where on the online public square and um, yeah, maybe this actually summarizes pretty well what I'm talking about today. Um, let's maybe start Upa. Yeah, with my motivation. Uh, to actually start working on digital trace data or web browsing histories. So I would say my motivation is sort of twofold. Um, first, I wanted to research political information consumption, but um, in a bit more of a complex context, um, because usually uh, research on information consumption is either focus on specific news media diets or on specific uh, news outlets or um, yeah on for example political information consumption on social media specifically I think both is fine um, but I would say that um, yeah political information especially in the digital world is also present in very different contexts and, and uh, yeah basically web tracking data or web browsing histories allow a very unusually complete picture of information consumption. So that um, is sort of my first part of the motivation. And then the second part is that I would like to build a bridge to the political communication um, landscape or, or literature, um, because of course, I would always say it's sort of a, a two-stage process, right? You you receive political information somewhere and then you discuss them somewhere else. And um, yeah, when you think about the internet, those spaces are probably interconnected and also the users are probably interconnected. And uh, yeah, I would like to sort of draw a more complete picture of this um, complex interaction of the political online ecosystem online. And um, yeah, maybe to give it an even more theoretical background, so to say, um, you can sort of not avoid um, concepts like the public sphere. So generally, what is the public sphere? Uh, it's the space that links civil society um, to the political system. And of course, this is a sort of old concept um, and uh, yeah, it was mostly uh, shaped by um, figures like um, Jürgen Habermas. But today, the field developed quite a bit. And um, today, more and more researchers are speaking about complex online ecosystems of yeah, political communication and information. And uh, in a sort of recent piece, deliberation, which is um, yeah, the part 
or the process, process of political communication within the public sphere was defined as um, a function of the structures and membership within the public sphere. And basically my project or my this part of my PhD project using digital trace data is what tries to actually map those structures on the one hand and the membership uh, on the other hand. Um, along yeah this this um online ecosystem so that is sort of the <laughs> theoretical chunk around my work and now it gets more technical <laughs> um yeah and um as i said right i'm interested in those structures and membership component of the public sphere or the online public sphere um there is a very useful or in my view very useful um yeah theoretical concept or yeah, uh, yeah, theoretical stream of literature that is called deliberative systems uh, literature and um, especially shaped by um, Andre Bechtiger. And um, I think that this literature is very useful, but very abstract. And this is why in the first step, I try to narrow this down to sort of more tangible concepts for uh, empirical investigation. So, and as you might remember, I just said, right, structures and membership. And so on the left hand side, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but uh, on the left side, here's the online environment, sort of the, um, the infrastructure of websites providing political information, um, spaces for political communication, and maybe even some spaces for online participation, for example, through online petitioning platforms. But uh, around those sort of politically relevant websites, which I would consider the online public sphere, uh, there is another big circle, and this sort of represents it, of course, the, the majority of websites online has nothing to do with politics, and those are just websites that are completely irrelevant for public discourse, um, mostly entertainment and shopping and banking and whatnot, right? So uh, yeah, this will be first step to basically um, define where the online public sphere is actually located, which websites are actually politically relevant. And on the other hand, we have the membership component, right? So we have citizens, again, a big circle, and some citizens are also not engaged with politics. They are yeah, they never read political information. They never talk about political uh, stuff, and they maybe even uh, don't don't go to vote. Um, but among the, the the overall body of citizens um, within a specific context, of course, maybe this is a language context, let's say, um, we have the online public, so people who are actively engaging with political information online, right, because this here is all speaking about the online sphere. And then um, just as a last um, point, um, those two spheres or the public sphere and the public are connected through mechanisms of selection and um, these selection uh, paths are something that I also try to map within my, my empirical work. So the first qu research question basically that I develop is how does the political online ecosystem look like and then the second one is who engages with this. Right. And, and basically, um, if you want to read about this further at some point, um, these are basically two papers um, that I yeah, uh, wrote up and uh, one is already out as a working paper, the first one, and the second one is in the process of finishing up. And I will sort of give a brief summary of both um, today. OK. Um, yeah, maybe I just start with the empirical part now if there are no like huge questions of understanding. I guess now it becomes a bit more clear what I actually did. Um, all right, so my data base, so my yeah, my, my baseline for empirical investigation was a, yeah, maybe sort of old but gold data set, um, uh, nam namely digital trace data that was collected in 2017. Um, users were tracked um, in a six month period or for a six month period. And they actively installed a URL desktop tracking software namely called, uh, yeah, namely Vakupa. And those people who installed this tracking software um, were part of a YouGov panel. Um, and basically the digital trace data is linked to panel survey data. Um, and it's a, yeah, a representative sample of the German online public um, along variables like gender, uh, gender, 
uh, age and to some degree education, um, like not perfectly, but uh, almost mirroring the, the German online public. And in total, the sample is um, yeah 1,282 participants. And yeah, and for those people, we have complete web tracking histories for six months. And as you might remember, maybe like German uh, election cycles are not like super salient <laughs> at the moment, but uh, in 2017, the year when the data was collected, um, there was also a national election um, going on. Okay. And yeah, the data, I did not collect the data in 2017, um, <laughs> not so long in my PhD, but uh, yeah, the data was kindly provided by my supervisor, Simon Munset, and he collected this data in a huge project together with um, Andy Guest, Pablo Barbera, and Jung Wan Yang. Okay. So as a first step, of course, I am interested in let's say political internet usage, <laughs> more broadly speaking. And so I was not interested in how people like, um, yeah, use entertainment websites or shopping or something, but I had to filter this huge data set of, um, here it is, uh, 56 million clicks or website visits. Um, I had to filter this down um, to political topics or political websites, politically relevant websites. And um, to do this, I used a, yeah, I would say two or three stage process. First, I constructed a dictionary um, using sort of summary, um, um, yeah, so sort of summary news reports of 2017. Um, so I, I tried to reconstruct which topics were relevant in the 2017 public discourse. And um, yeah, and then I did a first automated dictionary classification step, try to match those topics or those keywords onto the URL strings. And um, you all know, right, when you have your browser open and you type in a website or you Google something, then you have this um, URL like a string, um, which oftentimes, or yeah, especially when you uh, access news websites, uh, which actually contains relevant keywords in the URL string. And this was my, my um, point of reference. Um, then I sort of condensed the web, um, the, the, the entire data set to a sort of tentatively um, politically relevant web um, data set, which was about 1% uh, of the data. And um, I was, of course, I mean, I, I knew that this dictionary uh, selection sort of will have some flaws because especially if you think about social politics, uh, words like housing or family also occur in completely a political context. So I um, sort of condensed the, the, the data set down to domains and then visited those domains manually and actually tried to find systematic mismatches. Then I updated the dictionary, ran the entire query again, um, cross-checked manually again. And uh, yeah, that was basically an iterative process so that I had sort of positive and negative matches. For example, take the word petition, but don't take competition because that oftentimes, uh, yeah, just selected sports websites or something. Right, and um, so in the end, I had a pretty strict um, filtering process and I ended up with a final data set of 69 politically relevant domains and um, yeah still about half a million of website visits um, and the interesting thing is also if you think about the original sample of 1282 people we retained or I retained almost the entire um, sample so almost everyone engaged with some political content at some point of time during this six month tracking period which is of course also makes sense or I don't know um, <laughs> if this is surprising or not but um, also keep in mind that the um, national election also took place. Okay so first uh, filtering step took Isana, place. Do you see if uh, someone raises their hand or? Oh no sorry I can't see the hand. Okay I see that. and so yeah, just, Anastasia. Just a clarification to... question before we jump further. Do I understand this correctly? Of all engagements, only 1% were political engagements. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Does it surprise you that it's such a low in political? Yeah, so I was also a bit surprised, I would say. So first of all, I would say, um, so yeah, intuitively, I was also surprised. But when you compare it to other like political science um, or other tracking data sets, um, this is 
about it. Um, I've never seen more than 5% political online engagement. And so I think that is, um, yeah, that is sort of uh, also interesting to know when we look at the relevance of news um, headlines or something, right, um, for, for the overall engagement patterns. Um, yeah, um, however, generally, I would say that my approach was rather strict, um, because I did the, the manual cross validation. So I was, uh, I only kept domains in the data set when I really found at least something political in there, right? Like when I was really sure that the political keyword that was selected was actually there and it was not just um, like a, a mismatch. Um, yeah, so so I would say I have more false negatives than false positives um, in, the, in the sample, but overall it is sort of uh, mirroring what other, uh, what we see in other tracking panels. And last point, that doesn't include social media uh, impressions, right? Um, it it does. So there's also Facebook and Twitter. Um, you will see that in, in a second. But I would say that um, on social media platforms, especially on YouTube, um, you often have encrypted URLs. So I would say YouTube is a uh, is a special case. There, I can't say much about it. But for example, if you have Facebook groups or, um, yeah, especially, for example, for Facebook groups that are political, um, I actually have those um, impressions in the data set. Yeah. Yeah, good question. And I think this uh, surprise is, is something that I saw um, a lot when I presented this in a political science uh, conference and many, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sort of, it's it's sort of to the disappointment of many social science researchers that not everybody is engaged with politics all the time. <laughs> all right. So um, second step, of course, in the, um, in the process was that I wanted to bring a bit more structure into the online ecosystem. Now I, I knew, okay, so and so much um, political engagement is here, but I also wanted to see um, what specific type of online engagement is it, what type of function do those websites have, and how are they interlinked, so to say. And uh, to structure the online ecosystem or the online public sphere a bit more, um, I assessed those um, 69 domains manually first um, to look at their infrastructure, so to say. And um, if you look at the first three um, dimensions, uh, information provision, the provision of um, communication forums. So that does not mean that I evaluated the communication itself, but I just wanted to see whether there is the potential for political communication provided by a platform, and also whether there is the potential to sign a petition, for example, or to host a poll or something. Uh, right, so, and this is what I, um, yeah, just basically, I opened the website, I browsed it and looked uh, for the infrastructure and rated various criteria. Um, and then the second sort of layer of, um, of criteria that I assessed were the level of connectivity of a website. And this is something that I did by looking at, um, at a network. And um, of course, networks can be structured very differently. And I specifically created an edge um, or a link between two websites or two domains um, when a user visited um, two different domains subsequently, but within a topic, so to say, um, to give an example, <laughs> it's a bit, it's, it might be a bit complicated, but let's say I am interested in what Angela Merkel does at the moment. So I Google Angela Merkel. Um, and so in my, in my Google click, so to say, uh, I match Merkel. And then afterwards, I read a news article about Angela Merkel. And I'm saying Merkel because it was 2017, right? <laughs> and um, then I, I read a news article again about Merkel. Then an edge is created between Google and this news website. And if in case afterwards, I'm also discussing something about Angela Merkel on Facebook, then another edge is created between the news website and Facebook. Okay, so this is how the edges are created. So it's within user and within topic, um, because I also, uh, I, I have the, the topics because I matched them uh, to the URLs, right? Uh, yeah, and this is the, the network of um, of those sort of, interest flows or topic flows, so to say, through this um, through this network. And the criterion that I collected here was whether the website is connected to other relevant websites and is, uh, yeah, whether people 
visit them subsequently. And then uh, two more criteria that I looked at uh, were the inclusivity um, and heterogeneity. Can I just ask um, yeah, a sure. question um, yeah. about um, how do you define subsequently? Like, is that like in, over a period of time or just yeah. right after? Um, yeah, so that is basically, I mean, I have the, the history in chronological order. Yeah, and I read, um, I did not collect self loops. So when people were uh, like Googled multiple things, um, or like Googled something twice or refresh the page, right? Then I have um, sort of self loops because um, Google and then again, Google and then again, Google, this is what I dropped. Um, but uh, yeah, basically um, having subsequent in uh, visits in temporal order. So okay, say. so if I if I Google Merkel and then and then go to, um, I, I don't know, read the news story about her and I don't know, an hour late, like I, I continue doing all sorts of stuff, and then an hour later, I I post something about Merkel. Does that count or, or, yeah. or no? yeah. yeah, yeah, that is counted. Um, but if you would uh, say uh, Google Merkel, read something about Merkel, and then um, play an online game, then the the sequence is stopped or is interrupted, so to say. So yes. it's a very rough proxy, basically. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and then just just to explain something about the the last um, dimensions. Um, here, I just used a very um, rough form of um, seeing whether um, different people are engaged on a platform or whether the people using a platform look pretty much the same along um, their demographic profile. This is what I mean with inclusivity and uh, or whether they all look the same um, along their political opinions or political orientation. That is heterogeneity. I just had to find <laughs> different words for, for different things. And um, and here I just have a, a visualization of um, the, the metric that I used. Um, I, I used a, a sort of a, an entropy-based diversity index that is usually used in uh, in, in bio in biology uh, when you want to map ecosystems and the diversity of ecosystems. And I thought that is sort of a, a nice analogy, and it's a very simple mathematical uh, metric to to yeah apply this to websites. All right. Here we go. And then I had all those criteria labeled. And of course, I said I wanted to structure this online ecosystem somehow. And I wanted to know whether there are sort of commonalities and differences between websites. And I plugged all of this information into a lighting class analysis. And this is what I, yeah, what the model found. Um, and I find it quite interesting and pretty intuitive. Um, so let me just quickly summarize what is going on here. We have a big group of mainstream hubs, sort of, uh, yeah, I would say the half of the domains in the sample are websites that are very popular, that almost everyone in the German um, yeah, online ecosystem, political online ecosystem knows, everybody uses them, and they are um, especially characterized by high connectivity, high inclusivity and heterogeneity, just meaning everybody uses them, and they provide political information predominantly. Uh, on the other hand, we have a cluster or a class of quality information providers. Those are, um, and if you know the German um, media landscape a bit, um, also unsurprisingly, um, very high quality political information providers that often have a local reference because this is more or less public broadcasting or online out outlets of pu public broadcasting. However, those websites were not at all characterized by high inclusivity or heterogeneity. Um, right, So they only attracted a very specific user base. And we will look at who uh, use them uh, a little bit later. And then a third, somewhat surprising, but very interesting class um, that I found were, I, I labeled them niche forums. Those were websites that were, um, yeah, mostly not about politics themselves, or they did not provide political information, but people actually discussed politics on those platforms. And those um, platforms also could serve as forums for political organization, um, right? So to, to form interest groups or to organize political protest. And those niche forums in Germany were Reddit because Reddit is really not used by many people in, in Germany, but also really interesting anime forums, gaming forums, uh, sometimes cooking forums and forums for secondhand clothing, for example. And, um, and this is why I explained in such detail that I 
manually validated whether there was actually political information or political topics being discussed on those domains um, because I was so surprised and I was I just thought okay that's noise in in my data set and I have to get rid of all those weird websites that have nothing to do with politics in Germany but it was really interesting and if you have master's students who want to do I don't know some form of um, forum analysis I can highly recommend this um, anime fan forum because there's a huge pol political discussion section and it's uh, yeah it's really interesting what's going on there. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, I can can I just ask something? Yeah. Um, from from the uh, I say, can I assume that there was basically no data about low quality information providers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say. I mean, I did not rate. I mean, yes, I did rate the journalistic curation of information uh, on the website, and I would say um, those mainstream hubs oftentimes provided information, but just as, um, as an intermediary. And so, for example, I don't know, um, Wikipedia does not have journalists curating the stuff, but they had a, a form of fact checking. Um, Facebook also does not, you know, uh, they, there are no journalists working there and it is just like a secondary provider of information. Um, and then on the other hand, of course, you have um, like those big, big um, national news outlets um, that you have in this, uh, in this cluster, but the second um, latent class that we found, um, that was really like, um, there were only journalistic news outlets um, and either they were public broadcasting or just very few um, uh, yeah, private news outlets, so to say. I see okay. something in the chat. This is something I can see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, build was generally low quality. Yeah, the quality criterion here is um, <laughs> is more, neutral let's say it's like are there journalists <laughs> writing something but uh, yeah I'm talking I'm saying something about build later on and then uh, yeah it's it's shaped by a specific user base as well or like reader base <laughs> okay. okay so uh, but I think that was the, the perfect segue to the next section because now I will be talking a bit more about the um, yeah the users of those platforms oops <laughs> Okay, oh yeah, here's uh, AniSearch, that's the domain, of course, yeah, only German language, but I'm pretty sure those websites exist uh, in, in any type of uh, media system. Okay, yeah, and here we go. So let me show you, uh, or like walk you through this massive plot of um, engagement, right? Um, so overall, I found that um, users in the tracking sample, so if you take all of those 1,282 people, Overall, um, we had or we recorded 12 hours of desktop browsing. And among those 12 hours of desktop browsing, only 10 minutes per week were um, yeah, political content, right? So that was about 1%. However, what is interesting is that more than 90% of the sample engaged with political content at some point of time, right? And uh, yeah, then another interesting finding is that at least in this data set, we see large asymmetries between different social media platforms in Germany. Um, so while almost 60% um, used Facebook for political um, yeah, reasons, because right, I, this collapsing step or this filtering step took place before I, I looked at the engagement patterns, right? So those Facebook clicks here are all political. Um, however, on Twitter, uh, yeah, only 14% in 2017, uh, yeah, within the sample, only 14% uh, looked at Twitter um, in, in a political context. Sorry, Lisa, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, question for clarification. I don't understand how non-users can have a percentage of use. How do you? Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Or oh, maybe I should relabel this plot a bit. So this um, those bar plots are only presented because the density plots only include users. And then here I say who does use um, Twitter at all and who does not use Twitter at all, right? So among the entire sample, only fourteen percent oh, use okay. Twitter. And then among those 14%, uh, 14% right, got it. this is the, the distribution. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great question. Yeah. <laughs> Good that we clarified that. Um, right. 
Um, yeah, and then another point that I found um, pretty interesting that, of course, um, those large informational hubs or mainstream hubs that we found in the cluster analysis, um, yeah, they could be interpreted as a large shared space of politic political engagement in, in Germany. However, yeah, as a sort of more pessimist note, within our tracking sample, BILD was the largest source of political information overall. Um, yeah. <laughs> And now we try to map selection. And this is a huge plot and you don't have to read any everything because there is basically one factor that is important. So maybe just as a framing around this, what did I actually do here? I have um, various multiple regression models. And when you look at the outcomes, we have overall engagement, uh, with yeah, the internet online, political and apolitical. Uh, we have political information usage, political communication usage. Here we have specific platforms, Zeit, Bild, uh, so Zeit as quality information provider, Bild as tabloid news outlet, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and change.org as petitioning platform. And here we have those three uh, latent classes of websites again, right? Quality, um, so public broadcasting, niche forums, and mainstream hubs. And I tried to predict engagement with these different types of, um, of political media um, by throwing in all the model, uh, all the variables that we had in the data set, because as you know, this tracking data was linked to pretty rich um, survey data. And interestingly, there's, I would say, only one big predictor for engagement, and that is political knowledge for everything. And there is no strong selection along other um, demographic factors, or um, here I, I labeled this entire bottom category um, democratic attitudes, so to say, whether people trust in politics, whether they are satisfied with democracy, whether they are um, like sort of nationalist or whether they support dictators, support socialism, um, whether, yeah, where they position themselves on a left right scale. Um, I have to say, of course, there are some like nuances and some. Uh, yeah, some some tendencies. For example, what I found interesting here, um, down here was the the um, a vote for the AfD party. So the the right wing radicals in Germany um, predicted um, uh, activity on petitioning platforms, um, but not um, yeah the consumption of a lot of news. Um, but of course, you also have to keep in mind. I I ran multiple regression models to see every factor controlling for the rest. So to say, right? So yeah, political knowledge here by far the strongest factor. And then, of course, I mean, I said that right. We have a complex. A, um, yeah. A, sorry, another question out of curiosity. Could you go back to the previous one, please? Sure. Yeah. Uh, if I read this right, then one of the beneficiaries of high political knowledge was Bill. Uh, yeah. A lot about politics. Read Bill. Really. Yeah. I find that very peculiar. Yeah, I think this is something that also definitely surprised me. Um, I mean, yeah, political knowledge was also actually measured in a very complex way, right? Um, that was a long battery of, do you know this and this politician by the, the image of a politician, by um, statements of political topics, by names, um, just written names of politicians. Um, so people who score high on political knowledge. This is not self-reported political knowledge, but actual political knowledge. Um, and apparently people also get some political knowledge from BILD. Uh, so, right, this is a, a prediction model or a descriptive uh, regression model, right? This is not, there's no causal direction between political knowledge and, uh, and the engagement with this website, right? So you can also say, okay, even from BILD, people get some knowledge or, um, yeah, apparently those who have political knowledge or interest. I mean, of course, it always controls for the, the uh, respective other. Uh, yeah, they might also engage with build. And then, of course, it comes into play. We have a tracking sample and so on. But yeah, we, we see something more about build in a second. Good question. And I, I, I shared that surprise myself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I also, um, yeah share the, the same uh, question that I just saw in the chat. Um, this is why it's actually another good segue to the next section, because as you, you have to keep in mind that here I looked at every engagement form separately. But I mean, 
this is sort of also the theoretical premise that I make is that people use the web, uh, use different spaces of the web for different reasons, right? They might read um, on three different sources and then they have their favorite communication platform and then they have their favorite participation platform or they only do one or the other and maybe people might even systematically differ in that. And this is why I also looked at latent profiles of people. So um, in, in this model, I sort of took all different engagement patterns um, or like all different engagement types together, namely, and you, you see them here on the, on the left, engagement with site online, engagement with political Twitter, um, uh, engagement with public broadcasting, overall political usage, usage, overall online activity, engagement with niche forums, Facebook change and build. And um, yeah, through that into a latent profile analysis. And here we see something interesting, namely, um, it was very difficult to find sort of commonalities or common patterns. So there was not, um, we could not see a clear pattern of people who read build and use Facebook, right? It was only, okay, there are people who really like niche forums and there are people who really like change.org. Um, and in the data, there were really not many sort of yeah, combined profiles of, of patterns. Um, so yeah, that was interesting. However, here's some uh, a very interesting pattern um, that I would say resonates with intuition there. And, and there was only a small subset of people who actually used Twitter um, for political reasons in Germany, right? Or who, yeah, appeared to use Twitter in the sample. And those people score high on all the political um, uh, or yeah, significantly, uh, significantly high on all the um, political engagements, right? And for all other patterns, they are sort of, yeah, more or less mainstream, but for the petitions a little bit, but especially for Twitter, um, those show an unusually politically active profile, okay? And so then like taking into account that in Germany in 2017, right, only 14% of the sample engaged with, with Twitter and that those show high political engagement overall, then you might realize, and probably you all realize that already, <laughs> that, um, this is not representing public opinion or that is not representing the overall image of public discourse. Um, yeah, that is going on, right? When you when you do studies on Twitter only. Okay, and then last model, and I, I promise those are the last uh, coefficients that I show you. Um, I basically flipped the model again to predict the different um, user types or um, user profiles, right? Here are the political Twitter users. The, and the build readers in the latent profile analysis. And um, here we see the more intuitive results. And also this might be the case because we are not controlling for all the others in um, at the same time, right? So we're not holding everything else equal, but we are seeing the raw coefficients. And here we see, again, political knowledge dominates the entire picture. Those are the uh, orange triangles, right? They are relevant for everything except the inactive profile, right? Makes sense. Um, and then um, here for build, because we were, we were speaking about it before, here we see support for nationalism is a predictor for being a, pro, uh, a member of this build reader profile, right? And we did not throw anything that we knew about the people um, into this profile analysis, but only the engagement patterns. Okay, um, yeah, and I mean, so here I, I summarize, we don't have to go through all the coefficients, I summarize them a little bit. Yeah, political knowledge is super important, sometimes also political efficacy, so the self-reported um, trust in understanding politics. Um, and then we have some, yeah, specific um, patterns, namely that anti-nationalist attitudes were predictive for site um, readership and nationalist um, yeah for build readership so this is a sort of sanity check that this all makes sense in a way um, interestingly for site um, we found the uh, yeah, young age um, to be a predictor this is something I can only explain if uh, I think like anecdotically that uh, I guess that probably more old site readers still have the print subscription um, and young readers more uh, are more active on site online um, 
Right. Um, Twitter was also predicted by um, uh, yeah, anti-nationalist attitudes. Petition users here are also showing um, an anti-nationalist, left-leaning and older um, yeah, um, profile, which also, I would say, makes sense. And um, quality journal journalism or those who are uh, yeah, users or heavy users of public broadcasting in Germany show high trust in politics. And I think that also sort of is a very intuitive finding. Okay, so let me summarize. That was a lot of stuff. And of course you all know that's just descriptive, but I think there are some interesting takeaways um, from yeah, having a broader picture. Uh, yeah. First of all, again, political engagement is really just a small proportion of overall online engagement, but almost everyone engages with some political content from time to time. Uh, yeah, the German online public sphere, I would say, consists of a pretty diverse or surprisingly diverse set of sites fulfilling different functions for democratic deliberation, if you want it like that. You have large information hubs that can be a common source of political information. Uh, they can provide a shared reality and also potentials for cross-cutting exposure. We have political broadcasting. Uh, public broadcasting is um, still relevant, at least in 2007. Um, but it is not used by a diverse audience. And we see patterns of incidental exposure and actually in-depth discussions in niches of the internet that were previously more or less untapped um, by, by most researchers. So I would say it is worth considering uh, yeah, sites other than the usual suspects. And then, yeah, political knowledge is by far the strongest predictor for this passive consumption um, behavior or engagement with political content, um, especially with political information online. And maybe just as a side note, right, we know that when we look at active or yeah, more active online engagement, those people who write the comments online um, or who like and share and retweet, we know that those engagement patterns are much more skewed and that we have power users and uh, yeah, we, we, that the majority of content is created by a minority of heavy users who might also have rather extreme views, right? Um, so this is um, just something that, that I would like to emphasize because my findings that take into account also the, the, um, the entire passive behavior, all the reading online, is um, yeah, that we see a, a mismatch between this passive and active political engagement online, right? And think, I think that we should keep this in mind also when we think about hate speech and space, spaces online, who participates um, and so on. Uh, and yeah, we see a tendency, but I would really say it's a, it's a tentative evidence that people with more extreme political views tend to be more active on, on communication and petitioning platforms. Um, this, I would say, hints towards this asymmetry of active and passive engagement again. And, uh, and overall, I would say, of course, we have to always keep in mind that there might be potential selection bias when we look at any data online, um, especially when we do comparative communication research. Um, and yeah, maybe this, um, like taking a broader perspective, taking a step back before um, we actually go into the analysis of online communication might be like a, a way forward. All right, that's it. Thanks so much. Uh, it went a bit over time. And yeah, I'm totally happy to take any more uh, questions that we just unshare so that I can see you all as well. Um, thank you so much, Lisa. Um, that was uh, super interesting. Um, I I will start uh, <laughs> uh, with a question and uh, the, the benefits of moderating the discussion. Um, so <clears throat> I have a couple of points that I, I wanted um, to raise, and I'm, I'm intrigued by this uh, chain of um, um, of, uh, of themes that you track. And, and I have this hypothesis and I wonder maybe it's, a, it's testable with your data that uh, we see the people who are highly knowledgeable in, in politics, we, we see them engage with, uh, um, with the tabloids. And, and I wonder if this is really for information um, to, to gather information or just to say validate something that they think maybe becomes a, an issue, right? So people are informed by other sources and then 
uh, go to uh, to the legacy places to see that, um, or the popular tabloids to see that uh, it actually becomes a thing. So this is something that I I don't know. I have an hypothesis, and I'm wondering if it's possible to um, to test. And also, um, it's not something that you have uh, anything to do about. Uh, obviously, it's very impressive that you <clears throat> can track uh, the online. Um, behavior through this desktop app, uh, I do wonder uh, about the discrepancies between desktop and, and mobile. And maybe some of the things you see with age and or or the type of, of content people engage with, maybe that uh, if you have any anything to say about why it would be different. Yeah, I think those are two really, really good questions. I would say um, maybe let me take the, the second one first, because Obviously, this is yeah. This is only desktop. We don't have data on mobile tracking. Um, I think there are some very few projects um, trying to draw on this now. Um, but uh, for example, there is a recent study by Bernhard Klemm van Hohenberg. Um, I saw his presentation at um, EPSA this year, and he was trying to, <clears throat> for example, minimize the discrepancy between self-reports and um, desktop tracking data uh, because there are massive um, discrepancies between self-reported media, media usage and what you see in tracking data and you don't know whether this is just like reporting bias or whether this is measurement bias uh, which one is the the ground truth right probably it's somewhere in the middle and um, but he was trying to minimize this this discrepancy by also asking people how their online offline um, yeah, difference is. And um, this, including this in the model did not improve the model at all. So that was interesting. Um, maybe a hint um, that also desktop browsing is like at least um, similarly res um, representative, but I would say, especially like going into the year 2022 and maybe going forward, I would say that, uh, yeah, desktop browsing is sort of interesting, but it's mostly, you know, also work related for many of us and that, um, yeah, mobile tra tracking samples will become much, much more interesting in the future. Um, and then to your first question, not sure I understood it correctly, but was your hypothesis that um, people like us, so to say, people who are well informed about politics, um, like um, read on quality information providers first and then go to tabloids to check whether that's really a thing? Or... I, I don't know. I, I think that this is what I do. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I don't know if, uh, if, um, if this is really... Uh, that's really interesting. This is a common behavior. I, I, I would yeah. assume... But that would be testable, okay, well, absolutely yeah. testable. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't the profiles tell you? And you showed us that the build readers just have a single tick for build and nowhere else. And excellent like, points. Yeah. Yeah, so excellent point. That would be the case. Yeah. Then you should also see a point in um yeah, in other, like for example, public broadcasting. However, I mean, of course, maybe this is again another niche profile that is sort of cannibalized by the larger build profile who doesn't, you know, who who only uses build. But maybe there are those people who who have this this pattern. And uh, I mean, as I said, I constructed this network with uh, sequences of behavior. And to be honest, if I have a bit time, a bit of time left, um during during my PhD, I sequences will be what I would like to explore next um, because I think that's also very interesting. Yeah. Cool. Um, Anastasia. Yeah. So the related question that just popped into my mind while you were talking, like the Twitter users who were so active, were they active because of who they are and their political interests, or they are so active in different platforms because they are linked for Twitter to different sources? That is really interesting and I have no idea, right? Um, because that is also another, I would say, limitation of the data that we did not um, scrape the entire um, HTML text of the websites to actually see the links, right? Because of course you have um, physical links embedded in the text of websites. So you could also construct um, a network that is more like the the infrastructural network of the um, of the internet, so to say. Um, but we only looked at usage links, um, right? So I would say that the the why question is absolutely almost impossible to answer. I would say. Um, but yeah, maybe this is something that uh, we might also get a bit closer to. So if anybody of you is uh, <laughs> 
wants to build a very, very robust scraper that uh, can deal with like about half a million different structures um, to scrape the entire uh, HTML text. Like I'm happy to, <laughs> you know, guide you in doing this um, because yeah, I, I would also just like to know whether my um, findings look like dramatically different uh, when you have the entire text. Um, yeah. <laughs> Any any other questions or, or comments? I yeah, I think it's it's fascinating. Now, could you um, use something like NewsGuard to do an analysis of the quality or credibility of all the URLs in your sample retroactively? Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming you know you still have all that and to the extent that they show up in NewsGuard. NewsGuard has a few hundred in Germany, at least a thousand. Do you remember? Do you That's know? actually interesting. Yeah, I've, I've never used it um, myself. And uh, because also um, you, Amok, were asking about the quality of information yeah. providers, right? And at the moment, it's a very rough um, measure of other yeah. journalists or not, or is there any fact checking or not? Um, and yeah, I was, um, I will actually, th that's a good thing that I will also maybe do. Uh, yeah, like last God, stage. I can look it up. I don't know it off the top of my head, but NewsGuard yeah. does have uh, coverage in uh, in Europe. It has Italy and, and uh, France and, you know, it's got all this stuff in there, but Germany as well. And I think Perfect. it's a, yeah. Uh, and it's probably operating on the domain level, right? Domain right. or subdomain. Yeah, that's then that's actually okay. really easy to integrate. It's what makes it, uh, here we go, 145. It actually has more websites in France and German, uh, uh, France and Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, but in Germany, it has 140 sites. Nice, so, that's perfect. Yeah, that should cover uh, the, the news providers. I'm guessing now this is German, not Germany. So it might pick up some Swiss and Austrian stuff as well. But uh, anyway, so you might want to have a look at that and see if if uh, sticking in quality yeah, uh, totally. will, will give you something. I mean, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I, obviously. There are some hypotheses there. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. Not the AFD, for example. So. Yeah. Absolutely agree. And also looking at more, um, I, I was also already thinking about labeling like mainstream media and sort of alternative skeptical media, right? Um, uh, it, it is, I, I would say those, um, yeah, sort of, I don't know, fringe news sources are not so prominent in Germany, but um, because we have built, <laughs> but um, still, I would also have hypotheses um, about, for example, people discussing politics extensively in gaming forums or something, right? And there, I would be really interested to see whether they are, um, yeah, heavy users of public broadcasting or whether they are, uh, yeah, engaged in in other types of media. So, um, yeah, actually, it's a it's such an obvious thought to use NewsGuard, and it's an excellent point because I think it's really um, like when you start doing stuff on the you on the full tracking data again this takes forever right because it's, it's just a gigantic data set but if you have stuff on the domain level you can just like throw it in the model and then exactly. <laughs> you're good right exactly yeah. yes yeah that's a fantastic that's, point. that's, that's so the advantage of news guard i mean the disadvantage is that you never know exactly what people have read but uh it gives you a pretty good indication you know people yeah. who go to breitbart or newsmax or something you know the, <laughs> yeah they, totally they yeah, nice. <laughs> okay, terrific. Any other questions, comments? Yes, Dawn. So yeah, um, fantastic presentation, Lisa, has really got me thinking. Um, and I think this is more of a comment or question for the group because I was really struck by how small that proportion of Twitter users, of political Twitter users was, um, which doesn't, you, you feel like it's, it's not the case because they're also very loud on Twitter, if you see what I mean. This sort of um it spreads very far, it gets reported on in the new in mainstream news as well. So I wonder what that says for us about how it might be distorting um the public discourse. And I it's, I know this isn't covered in your research, um, but do you have any thoughts on how it might actually interact with the larger public opinion and elsewhere in the public sphere? Yeah, yeah, I totally um, share your point. And uh, I would say, 
yeah, to say the, the least, I'm also concerned about the representation of, of public discourse um, on Twitter and then how this is picked up by journalists, right? I think Twitter is, is really, really um, interesting for journalists, but uh, yeah, just seeing this, as I said, this mismatch between active and passive um, yeah, engagement online, and then even looking at different engagement um, patterns between different social media platforms, I would say maybe, um, because right, this data was collected five years ago, um, I would say maybe the, the um, like user base of Twitter also grew over time in Germany, um, but I would still say, right, this is, I mean, I would say no social media platform represents public opinion or represents the public discourse extensively. And this is why I even started to take this, you know, public sphere perspective and looked at the entire online ecosystem and not just looked at um, political communication on one platform or the other. Um, so I think we can never, um, yeah, but I, I would say one single social media platform will never um, help us uncover uh, what the public thinks or says. Um, but yeah, I would say, yeah, I'm, I'm equally concerned about this, yeah. And just a clarification, so this th doesn't necessarily mean they're posting on Twitter, it also covers passive consumption, like just True. reading what other people have posted. Absolutely, yes, yeah, this is even, um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, yeah. Yeah, even, even more surprising in, um, in that case, but good reminder as well. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Well, thanks, Lisa. That was really great to hear about that part of your work. I mean, you know, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with it from, from before. So that's brilliant. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, lots of stuff to think about. I'm sure I'll, I'll ask you more questions as we continue to work together. So that's really great. Absolutely. Uh, I'm also actually happy to send you all the link to the um, to the working paper of the, the first. Oh, cool. Please do. Please yeah. do. Yeah, send absolutely. it to Delmar and he can put it on the TED Cog. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do. Yeah. And Lisa, are you subscribed to the TED Cog? Um, Not yet. Not yet. How can I do Al this? <laughs> Delmar will put you on because we're having these meetings every week. And I think over the next little while, we have a whole bunch of external speakers such as yourself um and my best guess is that you'll be interested in a lot of them uh, absolutely yeah please add me to the list <laughs> and uh anastasia you're part of it aren't you are you no only then you forwarded so i, I was just typing please put me on as well but now okay. i can good, also say good. It. <laughs> yes Almar, please do because uh yeah we have lots of we have a guy from copenhagen in well i guess next week um, mm. and and it goes on and on and on some really um very interesting people coming and and some of them even in person which is really weird oh and philip our philip lisa is speaking on the 23rd of september oh nice we'll definitely mark this in my calendar yes, yes. <laughs> so uh almog if you could add them and, and send them a link to the um well by the way how does that work almog if you add people to the mailing list do they they don't then get all the invites automatically that other people already have. Is that no, correct? They do. I think they uh, do. then on forward. But do you do you uh, have usually when you you mean like with the usual with the the the, the, the weekly meetings? Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm reluctant to update those because then it spams everyone. But I can just add them to the to to what we have. So. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm usually just forwarding uh, forwarding the, the invite. Okay, okay, fine. Because it just occurs to me that they should get the calendar invites. The oh, new yeah, yeah. A a anyone who's on, um, I think, um, at least anyone who's, who's on Bristol gets the calendar invites automatically. But uh, those are not, I'm not sure how it works. Maybe send them out to Lisa and Anastasia in a separate yeah, I'll ask, uh, I'll ask how it goes. I think I'll stop the recording right now. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I've forgotten that we're still. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. It's um, the top of the hour, two o'clock for us here. And this is one of our weeks when we continue with a bit of professional development. 